Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Beth. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Beth. I'm Dan. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Dan. Yeah. Um, just real quick, we may or may not split this chapter into two weeks. There was a lot of stuff that uh, Beth had to say. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, we'll get right into it. And the first thing that Beth wanted to talk about was we have we have we hope we have made clear the distinction between the alcoholic and the non-alcoholic. So we're on page 44 in the very beginning of We Agnostics, and we've spent 44 pages talking about the problem as we see it, the problem as Alcoholics Anonymous sees it. Um, if, if you've gotten to this part in the book and, we're, and you're going forward, as it says in the rest of, rest of the paragraph, if you honestly want to and you find you cannot quit entirely, or if when drinking you have little control over the amount you take, you're probably alcoholic. And that was for me. Those were the, those were the two big ones um, to qualify my alcoholism. Going forward, we're not going to talk a whole lot, if at all, about alcohol. We're going to start talking about the rest of the disease and the symptoms or, and the solution um, to get free. And there's no more important chapter to me than the one that talks about God. Um, or higher power. So um, if you've gotten to this part of the book and you're not 100% clear on your own comfortability with your alcoholism, I suggest you get with a sponsor or somebody to really figure it out so that going forward your foundation is solid. That's what I needed to do. Um, it, it may be worth really quickly touching on what exactly an agnostic is. Uh, and we, we actually looked it up earlier today, and essentially, I think that's going to get it out, but essentially it's somebody who doesn't uh, really know one way or the other whether God's there. It's like being in the middle, being on the fence. Um, and, you know, I think there's a lot of times where that's even worse than believing one way or the other. You know, I mean, I'd almost rather be a complete atheist than not be sure either way. A person who holds that the existence of the ultimate cause as God and the essential nature of things are unknown and unknowable. A person who doubts or who denies or doubts the possibility of ultimate knowledge. Um, a person who holds neither of two opposing positions on a topic. So, you know, I, I'm, maybe God is there, maybe God isn't there. You know what I mean? I'm, I don't know either way. And that's, you know, that's rough, especially as a, a, a newly discovered alcoholic who's seeking a certain spiritual experience. I know for me that my personal definition of agnosticism is is understanding that God is right because it's so it's so blatant through the book that either God is or He isn't. And for me, my agnosticism is I know that God is. I just don't believe He plays a part in this part of my life. Um, so it's a it's a I believe He's there, but I've got it, which I'm prone to do. And I think we'll hit we'll hit that in a couple of spots in this yeah. chapter actually, especially with. Um, untreated alcoholism in sobriety. You know, it's one thing to be there when you're first coming in, but, you know, I know for me, in uh, in places, in spots throughout my sobriety where I've been in untreated alcoholism for either a short period of time or an extended period of time, it really, at its root, has to do with the fact that at some level I don't think God's going to take care of me if X, Y, and Z happens. You know what I mean? And it all just stems from, it grows from there. Um uh, second paragraph: To be doomed to an al- doomed to an alcoholic death or to live on a spiritual basis are not always easy alternatives to face. Yeah, I just you know, um, it's very black and white. When I first got sober, or when I first went through the book, it was very black and white. When my sponsor put it to me, that those were my two alternatives. Um, and it, and uh, and in fact, at some points, she'd be like, "Well, then just go drink." If you, if you don't want to do X, Y, and Z, then just go drink and get it over with. Um, it's not. It's not always. You know, when, when we start to look at um, not being a newcomer and start look at be, looking at being um, in untreated alcoholism, it's not always easy, and it's not as black and white. You know, I can choose God, or I can choose my way. And to be completely honest, there are things in my life where I am constantly choosing to do it my way until I paint myself into a nice little corner, and my only alternative then is to is to is to go to God. Um, 
And what we were talking about, I guess we'll talk about it later in the chapter two, is, is that in the beginning, we exhaust all of our, absolutely all of our other alternatives, other avenues, uh, before we go to God. Um, but later on in recovery, it really does come down to it's easier for me to choose God today because I have a certain amount of experience of what happens when I go to God. I also have more experience of what happens when I don't go to God. And it's not as black and white. You know, if I don't involve God, I start, you know, didn't involve God in the house that we, you know, we pushed. I was like, I'm pregnant. We have to buy a house. I don't care. Just buy a house, not having a baby in a rental, which is just the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. Didn't include God in it at, at, at all and hated the house the entire time we were there. Um, asked God to get involved and help us decide where we're going to wind up living now. And I'm happier than we've ever been. I wake up every morning and I'm like, I love New Jersey. I love our house. I love everything. <laughs> like, I'm so happy. So it's like, it's not as black and white anymore as far as, well, if you don't get God involved, you're going to go drink. But my experience is that I can either choose a spiritual life and do the work, or I'm not happy with the results. Which is interesting because when I'm not involving God, I'm only I'm I'm only interested in the results. So it's it's uh, you would think it would be easy, but enter an alcoholism and it gets a lot less easy. <laughs> um, Is that one? Uh, but after we after a while, we had to face the fact that we must find a spiritual basis of life or else. Yeah. So again, anything for me. We were talking about this. And it's not, it's not exclusive, but all of the musts in the book, um, going forward are, um, are in my opinion principles that we need to live by. So, you know, this is a spiritual program and whether you have a higher power that's based in science or you have a higher power that's based in literature or religion or whatever it is, um, we have to live a sp- on a spiritual basis or else, right? So it's not already just one paragraph down. It's not quite as black and white. <sighs> But that's that's it. We've painted ourselves into a corner. Um, you know, we beat the dead horse of being beyond human aid for the last 44 pages or 43 pages. Um, and the alternative is, is that if I'm completely beyond human aid, there's only one alternative, and that's a power greater than myself. Because I'm beyond my help. I'm beyond your help. I'm beyond, you know, the medical center's help and the rehab's help and all of the other stuff. Um, and I only have one alternative. So, um, oh, and then we move on to the last paragraph on 44 where it says, if a mere code of morals or a better philosophy of life were sufficient to overcome alcoholism, many of us would have recovered long ago. But we found that such codes and philosophies did not save us, no matter how much we tried. Again, human power, if I'm trying. Um, we could wish to be moral. Um, we could wish to be phil- uh, philosophical philosophically comforted. In fact, we could will these things with all our might, but the needed power wasn't there. Our human resources, as marshaled by the will, being all about me and me controlling, were not sufficient, and they failed utterly. So I decided to look up the word moral, and I thought it was a great definition. That's cornerstone. Moral. Of pertaining to or concerned with the principles or rules of right conduct or the distinction between right and wrong. Me and me without God, I can't differentiate between the truth and the false. So there's no way that I can, and, and I'm, I don't have the needed power to make this happen. You know, I can't make myself be on time all the time. I, I can't make myself pay my bills all the time when there's, you know, I want to buy a toy. Um, th- these are the things that I need help from God with. You know, it's also worth noting that the idea of this code of morals or a better philosophy, you know, I mean, the tools that we see in this book are really a better a, a code of morals or a philosophy. You know, amends, inventory, pausing when agitated, spiritual and uh, morning meditation, nightly prayer. You know, all these things are, are, are things that are wonderful ideas, but with, if we don't actually put them into actual practice, they yield no results. The power isn't there. You know what I mean? So I can know this book backwards and forwards. I don't. But I could know this book back, backwards and forwards, but that doesn't make me a spiritually living alcoholic. You know what I mean? Um, in fact, I know several people who do know this book backwards and forwards and are, I, you know, seem like they're suffering from untreated alcoholism. You know, 
the idea that the you know the needed power wasn't there. The whole the whole point of this book, and we're gonna that's probably the next thing we're gonna cover actually. Uh, well, that's exactly what this book is about. Its main obje- object is, is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself, which will which will solve your problem. You know that pr- that that uh, power greater than ourselves. That's what we're trying to tap into through having a spiritual experience. That's what we try to avail ourselves of when we you know we'll see it in the next chapter, I guess. Uh, but when we take the third step and we and we come to a place where we're you know willing to believe in a higher power in any form, you know, and we see that a lot of that in this chapter, um, just that the simple acknowledgement that there is a power greater than ourselves which can help us, you know, ir- irrespective of what the definition of that power may be, almost immediately we begin to see a result. We see a change. You know what I mean? I think it's also. Um from, from my own personal experience, when um, I was living in untreated alcoholism and when we lived in Charlotte, and I knew this book. I know what's in this book. I've taken people through this book. I've been through this book. But I'm living in, tr- in untreated alcoholism. I would get texts from people in Charlotte saying, Beth, where is this in the book or where's that in the book? And, for, from, and I could give that information to them. But this entire book became frothy emotional appeal because I didn't have a connection with my higher power. And that's that that's scary because the whole purpose of the book is to get a connection and a working relationship with a power greater than ourselves. Um, and we can have all of this knowledge, but if I don't have that connection and when I don't have that connection, this is useless. This is just, you know, a dust collector on, on my, you know, or taking up space in my back so that I can look like a good alcoholic, sober alcoholic. Um, you know, I've got, look at me, I've got all the highlights, I've got all the right stuff outlined, um, but if I'm not actually having a connection with my with the power greater than myself, who I choose to call God, then it's just useless. It's not the book that gets us sober. It's God that gets us sober. So. Um, and then we're going to jump down to the bottom of page 45. Um, Bill spends some time in, in the next few paragraphs talking about... Um, the idea of being able to put aside prejudices that we may have coming in here. Um, and in this particular line, actually, we wanted to look at it in a couple of facets. Um, to, to others, the word God brought up a particular idea of him with which someone had tried to impress them during childhood. Um, I know for me, my own personal experience, that I grew up in a, in a not super religious, but a religious enough Jewish household. Um, and... By the time I was 15, 16, completely really lost the sense of identity I may have had with the religion at some point uh, because I thought that the people that in my life that emphasized it were really overbearing. And the experience that I had, the experience that I had with it, you know, wasn't a personal experience. I was experiencing someone else's spiritual awakening. They had a very legitimate spiritual experience being a Jew. Um, and, and essentially what happened is that they were so eager to impart that experience onto me that they were trying to force me to have their experience. And it wasn't, that's not how it was for me. Um, and I, and I really disassociated with that religion for a long time. And when I came in here, you know, this was, this was a big line for me. Uh, the word God did just that. I started to immediately think about being told what I was supposed to believe and, and, and for what reason, what I was supposed to do to, to, uh, express that belief or prove that belief. Um, so I had some difficulty for a while getting with the idea of a loving and and uh, benevolent, bene- benevolent. <laughs> Did I say, I said it wrong the first time, right? Yeah. Okay. That's okay. Just making sure. You're just being me. <laughs> it sounded wrong. Right. I was like, anyway, benevolent. That one. Um, you know, God. That could, that that would be personal to me, um, and that was something of a hurdle to be overcome. Thankfully, it was easier than I than I thought it was. You know, and we'll see why in a couple minutes if you want to talk about the old Yeah, I, I worked with a girl a number of years ago who was a devout born-again Christian. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a wonderful religion. Um, but she was very well versed in the literature that comes with that. And she went to church every Sunday and her kids went to Sunday school and she did all of the practices that belong with that religion. And so she told me when we sat down to do agnostic, she's like, well, my relationship with God is fine. Um, so I, I'm, I'm good there. And I, and I kind of looked at her and I'm like, then how come you can't stay sober? And I said, if, if that, if that were true, if your relationship with God was fine, then you should not have an issue being able to not pick up. 
Um, and so we went away on a retreat up to Skinny Atlas, and I told her that for the weekend that she was to do the set-aside prayer, but in reference to her idea of God um, and, and her practices of God, to lay aside everything she thought she knew about that entire arena, God, religion, and the spiritual connection, and to have a new experience. Um, and she had an overwhelming weekend for her. She she began to experience God. She kept coming over to me repeatedly, like kind of just like I, you know. I went. She went for a walk. Isn't there the Stations of the Cross up there? She did a walk on the Stations of the Cross and had a fundamentally different experience than she had ever had doing that before. Um, and it was so she was able to have that personal. So it's everything that she. Everything that she had learned didn't get wiped away. It just got pushed aside so that she could examine it and have a new experience with it. Um, and that's what's required, right? It's a conditional program. You know, God loves us unconditionally, but this is a conditional program. It comes up numerous times in this chapter that we need this. That This is the essential core of how we get to stay sober is by allowing God to connect with us. Um, and then that first sentence, the uh, we have shared this honest doubt, honest doubt and prejudice. But that mention of prejudice, I think, is one of seven or eight times that it gets brought up. Um, and the idea, and the, uh, the 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 theme here is that we have a preconceived notion of something, um, and we want to try to get away from that. And that is another, like you know, heavy undercurrent in this chapter is contemporary to investigation, sweeping aside prejudice. Um, Trying to let it go of old ideas, and, and you know, in terms of long term, longer term sobriety, or or, or you know, uh, it, it issues after alcohol, right? You know, they will, you know, alcohol gets removed. I still have a boatload of other issues that I need to deal with, um, and and this concept of old ideas that Beth was talking about, um, you know, letting go of those can be just as important as the idea, the idea of letting go of alcohol, you know. Uh, an old idea, from, in, in my own experience, is basically one where I think that if that if I don't live by that old idea, whatever it is, I'm not going to be okay for some reason. And like we, we said that before, that that's just another another side to my own agnosticism, another side to my own belief that God is not going to take care of me. And that's the kind of stuff that needs to be extracted and, and gotten rid of. Um, and in we order, do that in, with in these order, tools. Yeah. Right, in order to have spiritual experience. Right. Continue this verse. Right. To grow an understanding and effect. We found that as page 46, sorry. We found that as soon as we were able to lay aside prejudice, it's mentioned number two, and express even a willingness to believe in a power greater than ourselves, we commenced to get results, even though it was impossible for any of us to fully define or comprehend that power, which is God. And then also throw in the, in the next paragraph, as soon as we admitted the possible existence of a creative intelligence, the spirit of the universe underlying the totality of things, we began to be possessed of, of a new sense of power and direction, provided we took other simple steps. We found that God does not make too, too hard terms with those who seek him. Um, so, you know, again, those two, I think, kind of speak to the same thing, this idea that as soon as we get to a place where we can, we, we believe, that we really believe that there's a higher power and that he can help us, whether it's with alcohol or a defect of character or the developments or the manageability in our lives, um, that we start to be, we start to see results. The, you know, when we're first, when we first get here, the alcohol problem just gets lifted and saying, and not drinking ceases to be a struggle. You know what I mean? That's the first, for, you know, for me, that was the first time that I really experienced the power of God in my life is the day I went to sleep and didn't wake up drunk. You know what I mean? Twice in a row, three times in a row. When it became, oh, maybe I'll go get a drink. Oh, that's a bad idea. You know what I mean? Like a sane reaction to the, the, the idea of, dr of drinking, you know, given my condition. Um, and then also the idea of, uh, you know, a new sense of power and direction. I know that, um, and, and this, this again, I think, can speak to, you know, issues in, in sobriety and, and longer-term sobriety and untreated alcoholism and old ideas, um, you know, when I get to a place where I believe God will take care of me in whatever issue I'm doing, I do begin to be possessed of a new sense of power and direction. And the more, I, the longer, the longer I stay sober, and the more I have those kind of life issues, the more direction becomes important—a new sense of direction, where I begin to 
have an intuition about the way a situation should be handled. I'm not freaking out and calling my sponsor and going, oh, my God, what do I do? You know what I mean? Um, the idea where given almost any set of circumstances, I can, I can with a sense of peace and comfort confront the situation and move through it and get past it and move on. You know, and there are times when I don't have that, and when I again get to a place where I'm, where I believe that God is the answer, God is everything. You know, then that sense of direction comes back. You know, I have that personally. I have that kind of situation all the time at work. You know, somebody yells at me for something or something ridiculous like that. Or anything really. It's usually work related. But I kind of think to myself, I don't know what the hell I'm supposed to do. And those are the times where I pause and agitated. And I think, you know, why? Where am I agnostic? What am I? Where? Why do I think that I won't be okay if X, Y, and Z happens? And I go, I will be okay. You know, and all of a sudden, I, I know what I should do. Even if I don't know the whole course, I know the next step that I can take. I think that um, I, I've sat with a, a lot of women who, when we start talking about this part of the book, they the fear <laughs> wells up inside of them. And it was the same for me, um, where I feel like if I really lay it out on the table that God will judge me or God's not going to forgive me or God is going to be mad at me. And what was told to me and what I tell to the girls that I work with is is that we're, we put human emotions and human reactions onto God and God's not human. And that was, that was mind blowing for me. That that was completely mind blowing for me because I, I was so afraid to make that initial contact and to make that initial connection where there would be a, a give and take between me and my higher power because then he would see all of me and be like, Oh, this, this chick's done. Just get rid of her. And, uh, and for, you know, for me, it was, it's important for me to become willing to set aside that old idea that God has human emotions because God's not human. Um, and then further down where it says, um, we began to be possessed of a new sense of power and direction provided we took other simple steps. I can tell you, you, you I, we hear about people, and I did this for six years, where it's the one, two, three walls where we do steps one, two, and three, one, two, and three. Yeah, oh, yeah, my life blew up again, self-imposed crisis. I'm powerless. I believe in God. I turn my will and my life over to him. And then I take it back, and then we have a self-imposed, a self-imposed crisis, and I've made a mess of things, and oh, right, God. And um, this is this is letting us know that we need to keep moving forward, that we need to finish the entire process. For me, I kept, and I shared this last week or the week before, where I always felt like I was starting over. I always felt that I would get to a certain part, I'd blow everything up, wreckage, wreckage, wreckage. Oh, yeah, I'm powerless. Oh, right, God. Oh, yeah, turn my will and my life over. Okay, start over. And ever since I finished, the first, since the first time that I finished going through the work, I guess I finished somewhere around seven years at the end of seven years sober, I, I've never felt like I'm starting over anymore by actually finishing the work. And so it lets us know, again, it, it's a conditional program. We get the freedom and we get the full spiritual experience by continuing to the next step. I mean, I know we're not there yet, but it, when we get to inventory, it says next we launched. So it's like this this constant movement forward of doing the next thing that is in front of us. So, um, And then the, <clears throat> the last sentence of that last paragraph, or the second to last sentence really, to us, the realm of, the sp- of spirit is broad, roomy, all-inclusive, never exclusive or forbidding to those who earnestly seek. Um, and we were talking about this, and it, I think there's actually two ways you can interpret that sentence. And I think there's one that's, I think, the more automatic way. It certainly is for me. Um, that if you seek God, the, the realm of the spirit will be broad, roomy, and inclusive, never forbidding. It won't be scary if you, see, if you are the seeker. The other way that to, to interpret it, and this speaks to what Beth was talking about, I think, last time or maybe the time before. I don't remember really. I'm sorry. But that as a seeker, I ought not be exclusive or forbidding to anybody else regardless of their level of seeking. Um, you know, <laughs> that everybody is already on this highway with me. And it's, you know, my responsibility to let, you know, let them be there without passing judgment on them, you know. Uh, it's really none of my business what their, what level of relationship they have with the higher power or what their higher power is. You know, I can, I can just, just as quickly turn, turn around and say, you know, well, God either is or he isn't, he's everything or he's nothing. If he's everything, why do I doubt where other people are? You know, it's really none of my business. No, I just, I love that, um, 
never exclusive or permitting to those who earnestly seek. Uh, for me, earnestly seeking can sometimes be laborious and I have to go and do inventory or I have to do something. But most of the time, and I'm thinking like 95% of the time, earnestly seeking for me means get doing my utmost to be in the moment right here, right now. You know, I, I operate under the understanding that God doesn't exist anywhere in the future or anywhere in the past. He only exists right here, right now, in this moment. And so for me, most of the time, it's earnestly seeking to be in the moment with my eyes open, looking for God. That's all it requires. You know, when we first moved here, um, you know, moving sucks. You know, you get ripped up from where you're coming from, and we were down there for seven, almost seven years, and, um, and you, you know, and we were coming home. You know, you would think it would be easy that we were coming home to New Jersey, but we get up here, and I was just jammed up. And um, I remember, I have a hard time letting people in my house. Like, it's my sanctuary, it's my safe place, so it's like a big deal. And I remember uh, just being jammed up, and it was hard. I was having a hard time connecting with God. I was having a hard time being in the moment and trusting that the stomach flu that my son was gonna ha- was having would eventually pass and he would eventually go back to school and I would find a preschool for my daughter and I was just, it, it's big, it's, it's heavy, it's a lot. And I went outside and I sat on the back porch and I was only able to sit there for about 10 seconds and I was able to connect. And I walked inside and for whatever reason, I opened the basement door where, a, like, I don't know, 20% of everything we own was to, like, a foot of water in my basement. And I was and I was easily able to call the landlord, have her come into my home, which was destroyed because it was just boxes everywhere, and let her deal with the issue. Like, on a good day, that's a challenge for me. But in that moment... Thank God I had, had said, well, God got me to the place where I connected. I connected, and then I had very easily was able to deal with the situation. So when they say that this stuff's going to solve all of your problems, like, uh, that's my experience. Having an open connection with my God has 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 sol- solved all of my, my problems. So earnestly seeking is... It's cool. It's, yeah, it, there's a range there, yeah, right? <laughs> What's the word I'm looking for? I don't know. I should go to college. (laughs) Uh, On page 47, do not let any prejudice you may have against spiritual terms deter you from honestly asking yourself what they mean to you. And again, that's that idea of contempt prior to investigation. You know, it says it somewhere else. Be be quick to 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 learn from some from from anyone really. Anybody speaking in spiritual terms, you know, you want to talk about that? You. well, it's it's again, it relates that back to that sponsee where she needed to push everything aside. And, and I get the same way, you know. The, I don't know any other way to comprehend, comprehend the power that is God other than to put him in a box, right? A nice, neat, human-sized box that I can wrap my little human brain around. The box that he was in when I got sober is not the box that I put him in now. The box is, is, is a million times bigger now but if I were to say, oh, my God's not in a box and, and, you know, I understand God, that would be my pride. And that would think, right? So he's infinite. I'm finite. He's, he's everything. I'm just this little speck. So for me, the box, is, the box has gotten bigger. But every single time I go through anything or a random Tuesday afternoon, uh, you know, something comes up where I'm challenged in my idea about what I think God is or is not or what he does or does not do is challenged. And I can either continue to live by the idea that I'm currently working under and God can stay the same size, or the box can stay the same size, or I can live, start living by the new idea that's being presented to me and allow that box to get bigger and my understanding to get more broad. That's, my, that's how my experience is. Uh, and then a little further down on page 47, um, that simple question, one short question. Do I now believe or am I even willing to believe that there is a power greater than myself? Um, and then as soon as a man can say that he does, he's on his way. It has been repeatedly proven among us that upon this simple cornerstone, a wonderfully effective spiritual structure can be built. I was reading slowly so she could get to the definition. <laughs> I thought this was beautiful. Uh, 
Chris talks about the, the architectural terms he puts in the book. They're all over the book, the architectural. There's the cornerstone and the keystone and the foundation, and he uses these, these terms. Um, and so I looked up the, the current definition for cornerstone. A stone, uh, a stone uniting two masonry walls at an intersection. Um, a stone uh, representing the nominal starting place in the construction of a monumental building usually carved with the date and laid with appropriate ceremonies, something that is essential, indispensable, or basic, a cornerstone. Um, and it, that gives me chills. That's how important this is. When we talk about a building, a structure, it's so important that that's where they put the date that this started. Um, and I think, honestly, if, if I know, okay, so I know honestly for myself, that the first time that I connected with God was the day that I got sober. Did I know I connected with God? No clue. Did I know that this was going to be a limitless load of awesomeness? No idea. But that's my sobriety day, and we do the exact same thing. We, we, we literally celebrate that date. Sometimes we celebrate it every year. Sometimes we celebrate it every five years, whatever. But that date is so important to us. It's the cornerstone. It's the, it's the connection between, the first connection between me and my power greater than myself, just enough to get me not drinking. So I thought that was awesome. That is awesome. Um, you know, and this idea, that, that short question, do I now believe or am I even willing to believe that there's a power greater than myself? Again, in problems inside sobriety, you know, in, in, in issues with my own agnosticism from time to time, um, that's the question. Do I now believe or am I even willing to believe that there's a power greater than myself? Yeah. Usually. Usually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm painted um, into a corner, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm sorry, when I paint yeah. myself into a corner. <laughs> right, and then I, and as it says, I'm on my way. Um, page 48. Many of us have been so touchy that even casual reference to spiritual things made us bristle with antagonism. This sort of thinking had to be abandoned. Um, faced with alcoholic destruction, we soon became as open-minded on spiritual matters as we had tried to be on other questions. Uh, it finally beat us into a state of reasonableness. Sometimes this was a tedious process. And I think that that's huge. I think that that refers both to, I think that it's important both looking at it when we get sober and we first get through the book. When we first go, we get sober, we've essentially painted ourselves into a corner. We have exhausted, when we come in here, right, welcome to AA, we've exhausted Every other avenue possible for us. I did. I just, there was, no, I mean, I didn't have a whole lot of resources. I was 17. But literally every other option, you know, and it talks about it earlier in the book. We drink beer instead of wine. You know, we drink on holidays. We make sure that we have 24 hours before we go to our IOP and get a urine. And, you know, we do all these different things to not have to stop drinking. Um, and so when we get... We get, when we paint ourselves into that corner, there is no alternative. This is the last one. When we, after we've been sober for a while and we've been through this work, it's not as black and white, right? Because it's not as, it's not as black and white like, oh, if, uh, you know, if I, you know, if, oh, if I buy that toy instead of pay my bills, uh, I'm gonna die. That's just not as black and white as if I don't go to AA and find a God, I'm gonna drink and die, right? So it gets grayer as we get, longer in recovery but that's it's those little things that start to cut us off from the connection of God so it's um, and again like we were ta I was talking about before the longer I stay sober the, the more of a good option it is and I understand walking in and I still I'm still agnostic I'm hugely agnostic when it comes to parenting it's a huge block for me um, when we moved here moving and setting up camp I was hugely agnostic afraid that I wouldn't get it right, totally negating the fact that God never gets it wrong. Um, and so these are things that we deal with later in recovery when we get scared and things come up. But for, for me, it's, it's, I think I just went off track, but did I just go off track? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> He's a good husband. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Good. Well, I, I the other thing about. that I think I'm going to pick up the track that she was trying to get back to was um, <laughs> sometimes this was a tedious process. Oh, right. Um, there you go. <laughs> uh, 
and that speaks to a couple things. Obviously, you know, it speaks to sometimes we just have the crap beaten at us before we even get in here. You know, I think, and again, going back to untreated alcoholism and, and in sobriety, you know, sometimes that can be a tedious process too. Sometimes that untreated alcoholism takes longer to see, you know. Um, I was telling somebody a couple weeks ago, like, the longer I stay sober, the longer the window where I go without living spiritually can, that, that, that window gets longer and longer where I can live in untreated alcoholism without feeling um, in danger of a drink. You know, the last time I did it, at no point did I think I was going to drink. At no point was I fearful that, uh, about alcohol. But my life was completely and utterly unmanageable. unmanageable. And I was the walking embodiment of the bed elements. You know what I mean? No, no control over my emotional nature, emotional nature. No real sense of personal relationship with other people. You know, I could make a living, but then I got fired. And then, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> But you know that's and that, that and that's what that's what my life was in in a in sobriety, you know, without living by you know the tools that we have that we that we get in, in this book, you know, and that was a tedious process. You know, my untreated alcoholism was a pers- it persuaded me eventually, but it was a, te- a tedious process. And you know, ultimately, if I really look at it, the, the the idea that it was a tedious process stems directly from the fact that I was living by old ideas. I was living by, I think that there's things are supposed to be this way, and if they're not this way, they're not, I'm not going to be okay. You know? And I did everything I could to try to make sure that things stayed that way. Um, well, that's the thing, too. When we're on untreated alcoholism, we're, we're living in a delusional lie. Mm-hmm. Right? So we're right back into that insane thinking where, where now we're living in a delusional lie. We're living by an old idea, and anything that happens around us, we have to make fit into that delusional lie. Because the consequence then is having to wake up. And when you're in, in an untreated alcoholism, you don't want that. Or you, you know, your alcoholism doesn't want you know, you just don't, you don't want that. You want, you want to just keep continuing down. And that's, I think that's why it's a tedious process is because you have to literally have another, uh, you have to, you have to have God step in and have that moment of grace again and hope that you can get either woken up from the outside, which is, almost and virtually impossible to allow somebody else to tell you you're in untreated alcoholism. Um, it's a process in which you can either choose to seek God or continue down the path and hope that you get a moment of grace. For, for me, it was my best friend dragging me back up to New Hampshire to see Cass and then getting a woman to take me through the work again is what brought me out of it. Um, but that was a relationship that I had with my best friend was like 13 years old already. And I trusted her with my life. And so when she said, you're, you're messed up. And that's not the word she used. Um, you know, I flew up to Jersey and we drove up to, to New Hampshire to see Cass. And then I came back and then we went to a workshop in, I think in Vermont. And then I got this woman to take me through the work. And then I woke up. But it was, it was, thank God that I had a period of sobriety in my life where I was connected. I did have a sisterhood. I did have a fellowship and people that I did trust with my life that we had the agreement that if I need to slap you upside the head, I will. Um, and we get, we, we gave each other spiritual license for years and years. Um, and thank God when it came time that I needed to be slapped upside the head, um, I allowed her at least to take me for the ride. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, what did this say? We used to amuse ourselves by cynically dissecting spiritual beliefs and practices. When we might have observed that many spiritually minded persons of all races, colors, and creeds were demonstrating a degree of stability, happiness, and usefulness, which we should have sought ourselves. Yeah, that just makes me sad. Because this is what we do in Alcoholics Anonymous. We do it outside of Alcoholics Anonymous. We do it inside of Alcoholics Anonymous. We judge people. We judge people. We judge their process. We judge their God. We judge their sponsor. We judge the home group that they have. We judge the the brand of sobriety that they have. And what that ultimately is, is me playing God. And I've seen people leave these rooms, not come back, and I don't know what happens to them because they feel judged. You know, I am, I can only speak from my own experience and I can tell you 
that I have absolutely no right to judge anybody's program. I walked around Alcoholics Anonymous for six years before I was ready to go through the book. I walked around, I did the one, two, three walls, I did the don't drink and go to meetings, I did the uh, diners and bowling, and I would watch softball but not play, and picnics and all of that stuff, and I did not pick up a drink. The grace of God is the only thing that kept me sober. Now I've been through the book, I sponsor people, I have a sisterhood, I have a fellowship, I have a connection to my God, and you know what? The only thing that keeps me sober is the grace of God. And I, I can't, I, I, when I find myself doing it, I have to stop because I am going to be the one who pays the price. When I start to think that I am any better or any worse than any other human being in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, it's my disease trying to trick me, subtle foe, all of that stuff, uh, trick me into untre untreated alcoholism to get me somewhere other than right here, right now, and to get me away and separate and different from the people that are saving my life. I was just, I was just thinking that's, um, you know, I've had that experience, and that's, that's effectively what happened to me. You know, I, I went down to North Carolina thinking that North Carolina is never going to be like New Jersey, it's and, it, not. and it wasn't. Thank you God. Know what I mean, and I made sure that I pointed that, that that out to myself every opportunity because you know there's no way that I could really, you know, live a sober lifestyle by those standards. So why even bother? You know what I mean? And there I was, three whatever years later, living on a tree of just well, I think it's fair. happened just the way she said. Yeah. I think it's fair to say that it, you know, because this this alcoholism thing, it doesn't just relate to my life in AA. It relates to my life. You know, my best friend asked me 48 hours ago. She said to me, "Would you have ever moved to Westfield if you didn't live in Charlotte for six and a half years?" And it stopped me dead in my tracks. And I said, "No, absolutely not." It took us two years to acclimate down there, but the, but once I started to embrace Charlotte, North Carolina, for being Charlotte, North Carolina, and not being different from New Jersey, I got so many facets inside of myself changed in so many ways that I have become a different person, and I choose to live in this town, partially in large part, because I learned how to be a part of a community down there, which was not something I learned ever in New Jersey. Um, and so, you know, it's that, yeah, did I explain that? Yeah, right? So, yeah, I wouldn't be the person I am today had I not seen where the Southerners were way better than we were. Way better at a lot of stuff. And I spent a lot in there. I, I'm very, I love looking at the differences. Like, I, I wish I could just go study culture for the rest of my life. Um, but there, there are things that we're better at, and there's a lot of things that they're better at. And by learning how to be like them, I get to carry out God's will for me in a much more full way. Um, going on to the bottom of page 50. Um, they flatly declare that since they have come to believe in a power greater than, than themselves to take a certain attitude toward that power and to do certain simple things, there has been a revolutionary change in their way of living and thinking. In the face of collapse and despair, in the face of total failure of their human resources, they found that a new power, peace, happiness, and sense of, sense of direction flowed into them. This happened soon after they wholeheartedly met a few simple requirements. Um, you know, that's... Uh, we're right down here, principle and promise. You know, I mean, that's... that's, that's I don't know how, how, how better to promise what can happen as soon as you start to, you know, get on that journey with a higher power. As soon as you start to get towards that level of belief that, that, that there is a higher power or, or willing to believe it. Um, you know, we, we talked a minute ago about the sense of direction, but of the, uh, the, the revolutionary change in, the, in, their, in their way of living and thinking, you know. Um, my, my approach to life... <clears throat> has fundamentally and completely changed as a result of having a spiritual awakening, um, as a result of taking, like, going through the steps and, 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 and doing all these simple requirements, you know what I mean? Simple conceptually, 
pain in the ass, <clears throat> practically speaking. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, and, and it's every now and again, the, the, the difference in, in my life now to my life before I had these, awak- these awakenings is so stark um, that I cannot believe myself that I'm the same person. Um, never mind what everybody else thinks. It's always nice to say, hey, you seem so different, you seem so, so content, that's great. You know, you know, but the, the thing for me is that um, I see it in my own life. You know what I mean? I see the effects of the power of God. I see the aftermath. You know, we were talking about it before, and I may be bringing it up prematurely here, but we were talking about it before. Somebody, somebody asked Beth where it was like, the question was, you know, if someone gave you indisputable proof that God didn't exist, would you still believe in God? You know, the, the proof of God for me is not external. You know what I mean? The proof of God in my life is my life. You know, the fact that I live it the way I live it, the way that I engage in life now as opposed to the way I didn't engage in life then. That's the proof of God to me. You know what I mean? I got to a place early in sobriety and again over and over and throughout sobriety as I, as I, as I got it perfect, um, where I became willing to believe in a power greater than myself. And that belief, that, that simple beginning led to growth, the, the likes of which I would never have even thought about, let alone actually done. So. That's not the same guy I married. Sorry. No, I'm glad. <laughs> I'd adore that guy. <laughs> um, no judgment. No judgment. So I just I want to jump a little bit because here it says um, they found that new power, peace, happiness, and sense of direction flowed into them. For me, when I'm not feeling those things, I need to go directly to page 52. Mm-hmm. Um, and look at the bedevilments. The bedevilments is one of the best uh, diagnostic tools, did I say that correctly, um, for me in the big book. Um, and what, what, I, what I do and what I have the girls that I work with do is, um, where is it? Right. Why can't I? I look right at them and I don't see them. <laughs> Denial. It's good. You're so scared. I'm so scared. Um, <laughs> So I need to ask myself, and what we do is we put each bedevilment on the top of a page, and then every night for five or ten minutes, we look at them and we write, we write about them. Um, and it starts with, uh, where am I having uh, trouble with personal relationships? Where can I not control my, my emotional nature? Where am I prey to misery and depression? Um, how do I feel I'm not making a good living? Um, where do I feel, when and where do I feel useless? When am I full of fear? When am I unhappy? Um, And where can I not be of any help to other people? Um, Because the promise here is is that when we have a connection with our God, that we we feel that we have a new power, peace, happiness, and sense of direction inside of us. That no matter what happens around us, this is how we react to life with these attitudes. If I'm not reacting to life with these attitudes, I need to use this diagnostic tool to figure out what's going on and then go to inventory. Did I just jump around too much? No. All right. Um, I don't know what even what I want to do next. I guess, again, you know, on page 52, right before the developments, you know, it says it's not our age characterized by the ease with which we discard old ideas for new, uh, by the complete readiness with which we throw away the theory or gadget which does not work for something new which does. You know, I was that, it. yeah, that is uh, that that is essentially you know me finding out that something in my life isn't working and trying to get to a place where I realize that it doesn't work and try something new. You know, I mean, it's 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 as, it's really is as simple as that. Um, I, I've been trying to think of an example for. A, since we started talking, and then, yeah, no, um, old ideas come up all the time, though. You, you want to you want to find out what kind of old ideas you're living by? Have children. <laughs> they will ask you why you do everything. <laughs> everything, mommy. Why do you drink coffee every morning? Or, mommy, do you know how to make coffee? Because Dan makes my coffee in the morning. Hey, I actually, I actually have an old idea. Actually, so we have a five year old, healthy, very attitudey daughter. Um, you know, and there's, and there, there's a, there's a certain level of, of, of me as a parent that wants to try to put, you know, keep the attitude to a minimum so she doesn't, you know, die, run right over us, <laughs> and um, get killed. you know, but there's also a certain amount of, of, of parent in me that wants to, um, 
not encourage it, but at least not completely squash it because that's part of who she is as a person, you know. Um, and and at, with her as a daughter, I've gotten into um, a lot more feminist reading, and it's changed the way I see I see the world. Um, you know, even even with my own even with my own thoughts, um, stupid things like you know things that I never would have even thought of it, but just 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 clue me into the way that I, at a conscious or unconscious level, think about certain things. You know what I mean? And and being awakened to those things and, and seeing that they don't work. Now it's on me to go to a place where I look at that, appreciate it for what it is, make the changes I need to make, and, and, and move forward as hopefully a better person. You know what I mean? Or at least a more effective father. And I think also in the last couple of years... Our whole culture has been challenging what we think of certain things. You know, I mean, I know this is going to sound off base, but it's not. I saw this uh, video of the narrator asking a whole bunch of girls of different ages to t- show me what it's like to throw like a girl. And every single one of them threw like a little whip. You know, oh, you throw like a girl. And then they went into this whole explanation of, you know, what does it really mean to throw like a girl, right? Because I can tell you, when it comes to, is that Dorsha? When, when it comes to athletics, my daughter puts my poor son to shame. <laughs> you know what I mean? So if you were to ask my five-year-old, how do you throw like a girl? She would throw like a rock star. So it's like, it's challenging these old ideas. What do I think of women in society? What do I think of religion in my life? What do I think of stay-at-home moms? What do I think of you know, career, people who, who spend their whole life making money? What do I think of people who give up their lives and do Doctors Without Borders? Like, these kind of things, it, although it seems beyond the scope of what we're talking about in Alcoholics Anonymous, it's not. Because this is about our life. We get connected with our God. The old idea comes up. We challenge it. And we get to live the life we choose to live instead of it being dicti- dictated by parameters of our alcoholic life. You know, it says in the early, or early on in the book that our alcoholic life seemed the only normal ones. But it's not just the alcohol. It's how we respond to relationships. It's the jobs we choose. It's the cars we drive. It's the towns we live in. It's the people we spend our time with. It's how we treat our parents and how we treat our kids. It's how we respond. It's whether we pay our bills or we don't pay our bills. These are all the different things that we learned when we were drinking and now need to be challenged now that we're sober. God brings these things, right? I can... I. I get that connection with God, and God's going to bring each one of these issues up for me to make a decision about a current idea of whether I'm going to choose to continue to live by this idea and it's a rule in my life, or I'm going to discard it for something else. Yeah, I mean, the other thing to think about is also that, you know, when we think about what are we supposed to do, we're supposed to grow in understanding and effectiveness, we're supposed to fit ourselves to be of maximum usefulness to God and others. You know, I don't actually, I'm the last person that knows how I'm supposed to do that. You know what I mean? So when these things come up, these old ideas come up and I see them, it's on me to change them so I can fit myself to be of maximum usefulness to others. I don't know how that change is going to lead to that. All I know is that that change is going to lead to that. And I, and, and I better do what I need to do to, to make that happen. Um, I can also tell you that when God has brought old ideas to the surface for me and I've been too afraid to challenge them, they start to wreak havoc in my life which is a surefire way for me to step even further away from God because now I've just stepped into a delusional lie of not right. My <clears throat> my sponsor told me when you take the third step, your life is no longer any of your business. And so you're not allowed to lie anymore because if God brought you to it, he'll bring you through it kind of thing. And so there's no need to ever lie or make up something that's not real because if God brought you to a situation and you were blatantly asked a question, you tell the truth understanding that God will take you to better places. I where I was going. Wow, I'm really not here today. <laughs> uh, so we'll reel us back in right now. And on page 53, it says, um, I'm sorry. When we became alcoholics, crushed by a self-imposed crisis, we could not postpone or evade. We had to fearlessly face the proposition that either God is everything or, is he, or he is nothing. God either is or he isn't. What was our choice to be? You know, what is your choice to be? When I got to a place when I was beaten into a state of reasonableness and got, and it was like time to say, God either is or he isn't, what was my choice to be? You know, had I said he isn't, 
I'm probably not as reasonable as I think I am. Um, you know, and the same thing goes for problems in sobriety and, 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 and living in little, maybe certain degrees of, of, of untreated alcoholism or just trying to get past an old idea. You know, God, God either is or he isn't. You know, what is my choice? Stupid things. I have to give notice so I can go to a new job. I'm worried about what they're going to do. Why? You know, what if, and they, uh, you know, the, basically I'm, I'm an independent contractor and I'm worried that they're going to tell me to get out. You know, I, I got to give my notice. Leave. Okay. And then I'll be out of work for two weeks until my next job starts. And that terrifies me. There's not a lot of money. But why am I so worried about that? You know, wh- why do I think I won't be okay if I don't work for those two weeks? First, I think two weeks ought to be fucking awesome. <laughs> but you know, but so so why am I so worried about that? You know, is God either is is or He isn't? So God either either is either bringing me to a place where where I'm going to be of maximum usefulness to, to to Him and others, or I'm not, or or He isn't. You know what I mean? And I believe He is. So at any given point during when I feel a sense of of doubt or cynicism or skepticism about that situation, God either is or He isn't. And for me, every day He is. And as soon as I remember that. All those feelings of doubt just go away. Um, and then we need to jump to page 55. Um, this, you want to talk about this. Yet we had been seeing another kind of light, a flight, sorry, of spiritual liberation from this world. People who rose above their problems, they said God made these things possible, and we only smiled. We had seen spiritual light release, but like to tell ourselves it wasn't true. Well, that, about yeah, well, that, I mean, that just, uh, I've already kind of talked about it, but when we're in that untreated alcoholism, or when we're drinking, or when we come in here and we haven't taken these steps yet, we'd be living in a delusional lie, and anything that challenges that, you know, I talked about it before, anything that challenges that delusional lie has to get, we have to get rid of that. We ha- absolutely, will, we have to go to any lengths to get rid of it. Um, so when we see, right, so we're living in alcohol, so I was living in alcohol, it's anonymous, and I'm sober, and I'm seeing people talk. I'm starting to see PT people talking about the book. And my stepbrother comes home from a, I don't know, some pa thing, and he's all fired up, and he's got a big book of Alcoholics Anonymous on him, and and he's like, look at all this stuff in here, and you know this, that, and the next thing. And I remember distinctly being like, oh, it doesn't mean anything. It can't be real because it came from one of those young people conferences. Like, and I hate young people's conferences. Nothing against them. Dude, I'm sure they're a lot of fun, but there's, like, too many people, and it's just, just not my thing. And uh, I don't like grown-up conferences really either, but um, but, it was, but, the, but it was this whole thing. Like, I saw this light inside of him. He came home, and something was different, and I needed to push it away. I needed to just negate it. I needed to say, oh, it's just probably because he met a nice girl at the pop. PG version. So, uh, you know, and that's what it was. That's what it was. I need, I needed to push that aside because I was not ready to, to do this deal. I was living in a delusion that I was keeping myself sober. I was living in a delusion that if you don't drink and go to meetings, that if I didn't drink and go to meetings, um, that I would, that I would be sober. And so it's, you know, I would tell myself that this, this couldn't be real. This just couldn't be real. Came on, and he basically disturbed us. You know what I mean? Oh, he just came on and said, and he was he was showing us a, a way of doing things that was different from our own and appeared to be maybe more effective, you know. And ah, that's not okay. You know, I don't want to change what I'm doing. I kind of like what I'm doing, you know. So we, why am I disturbed? And here's the cool thing: he came home and he was just excited. You know what I mean? He didn't come home telling us that we had been screwing things up the whole time. He came home and he was just fired up, was talking about you know whatever speaker he had heard or whatever group he had heard, and he was just fired up. You know what I mean? And, and and it was on me to either go get offended or, you know, I talked about that briefly on you know, whatever, page 51 with, you know, Columbus and Galileo. And, you know, am I going to be those people, they hit their contemporaries and just and just sit there and tell them why that's not true? You know, why am I disturbed? Why do I feel so defensive? About it? Um, oh, and then uh, I think the last thing that I want to talk about, maybe that, that's something else she wants to say. Nope. Um, but we were talking about earlier about the realm of the spirit and the and uh, is roomy and all inclusive. Um, and, and then we were as we were going through, we realized on page 55, yeah. you know, if our testimony helps sweep away prejudice, enables you to think honestly, and encourage you to search diligently within yourself, then if you wish, you can join us on the broad highway. You know, that's essentially the the, the instructions for how to seek. You know, think honestly, encourage you to search diligently within yourself, and sweep away prejudice. You know, I mean, 
we've already talked about all those things in and of themselves, but that's. But those are direct instructions, right? It talks about join us on the on the highway, um, and that's how we do it, right? That's what's required, um, and those are the instructions: um, is to search and um, to think honestly, right? We can't do that without God. Search diligently within yourself, right? Inventory and enjoy and join us, you know. I, here's the thing: I promise girls all the time. There are a couple of girls in Charlotte that came to me for sponsorship that said, "This is my last ditch effort. I've been in NA, I've been in and out of AA for X amount of years. I've done this X amount of times. I've done inventory. I've done amends. I've never been through the book. I've never done it this way." I tell them all the same thing. They say, they say "This is my last ditch effort. If, if you can't help me, I'm quitting AA. No pressure." And uh, I'm like, "All right, there's no pressure because it's all God. It's not me." And I tell them all the same thing. And it's actually, it's, now that I think about it, when, when this work was presented to us, I called a guy named Pat, and Pat got sober with Mrs. Delaney, and Mrs. Delaney got sober with Bill, right? And I got sober, right? So this is where I got sober. This is the, where I got sober. And so as far as I was concerned at the time, of course, I waited till like 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock in the morning to call, to call the poor guy because I wasn't selfish. And um, I called him, and I said, Pat, they're telling us we're not sober. They're telling us that we're not doing AA. They're telling us that that this that the instructions are in this book. I'm not hearing this. Why have I never heard? Why you know? And I'm asking him all these questions. And he said to me, "What I say to this, the girls that I sponsored in Charlotte, or girls that are, this is their last ditch effort. Try it. If you get through the entire process and it doesn't work for you, go back to doing what was." And that statement immediately wiped away every bit of fear. I was under the impression that if I, that if I, I was under the, the delusion that if I decided to admit myself into this process, that whatever I was doing that was, that I thought I was keeping myself sober would be completely washed away and erased from my memory. And I would be lost and alone out in the world with all of those bars and liquor stores. I mean, that's literally the delusional lie that I was telling myself out of fear of doing this process. And so that's what I tell the girls. I say, it, do it. Do the whole thing. Don't get, don't skimp on anything. And if it, if, if you're not, 10 million times happier and more useful than you were before the process, you can go back to doing what you were doing. And so, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and now the real last thing. Um, you know, on page 56, the, you know, the guy who says, <laughs> who are you to say there is no God? And then, and then uh, the presence of God pours over and through him, and he really gets to that place where he wholeheartedly believes in a power greater than God. Um, Thus was our friend's cornerstone fixed in place, no later vicissitude is shaken it. His alcoholic problem was taken away. That very night years ago, it disappeared. Save for a few brief moments of temptation, the thought of drink has never returned. And at such times, a great revulsion has risen up in him. Uh, God had restored his sanity. What is this but a miracle of healing? Exactly. You know? Alcohol question aside, all that is absolutely, absolutely true for me. You know what I mean? If when I think of alcohol and I think, oh, that might be good, the next thought I have is, but I can't drink. You know what I mean? As an alcoholic, as a recovered alcoholic, that is as sane a thought as I can get with respect to alcohol and taking a drink. Apply the same principles to any other issue that I've faced in AA outside of alcohol. Let's use the same example of having to give notice of my job again. You know, when I turn back to God, all of those fears and, and, and all that, I, that sense of relief just flows in and it ceases to be a problem. It's still an issue that I need to go and deal with and be an adult about. Like, I still have to walk into the office and actually have these conversations. But I'm not afraid of it anymore. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? God has restored me to sanity with that problem. It's not taking up space in my mind. I'm not, I don't feel it in my gut that it has to be done. You know, it's just something that's got to be done. Um, and exactly, what is this but a miracle of healing? I don't know, that's all I got for tonight. Well, for me, I just wanted to also say it's like, you know, it's real easy to read this book by yourself or with a sponsor and blow by that line that says, who are you to say you, there is no God? We all kind of schluff and laugh. But for those of us that are in serious agnosticism, um, need to sit with that statement and figure it exactly why I don't think that God is there. Um, right? Because it's easy. My alcoholism and the beast wants me to just schluff that off like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And then just keep continuing to think that there is no God. 
but actually write that question down on a piece of paper and challenge yourself to actually write down why you don't think that there's a God or why you don't think that God's going to help you in this situation, and you've got more inventory. You've got exactly what's keeping you, what's keeping you from your connection with God. Um, you know, so many things in this book, right? The book is completely just filled with things that if we stop and look at them for what they are in just a raw sentence and answer the question, um, it always exposes my, my current alcoholism, my untreated alcoholism, my agnosticism, or whatever it is that's standing between me and freedom. You know, the freedom where you get up in the morning and you're excited about a cup of coffee. You have coffee every single, whatever you do in the morning, like you're excited, you're brushing your teeth, like that kind of freedom. Like, you know what I mean? You open your front door and you're like, look, it's my car. I love my car. Um, maybe that's not a good one for me, but, uh, <clears throat> my unreasonable obsession with my truck. Anyway, but you know what I mean? It's like, you know, kids walk into the room and you're like, oh my God, they're awake at 6.30 in the morning. <laughs> you got to be really free to say that. Um, so it's just, you know, when we look at these things, you know, who am I to say there is no God? Who, who do I think that I really, who do I really think that I am? that I could make a judgment call like that. And that, that for me, holds true with any judgment I have. Who am I to say that they're not working a program? Who am I to say that they're not raising their kids right? Who am I to say that they shouldn't go out and make $10 million? Who do I think I am? So, okay. We're done. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.